I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on end-of-life care. Life is a terminal condition, but each year half a million Australians are affected by terminal illness, and dealing with end-of-life care often presents a challenge for healthcare professionals who are often focused on cure rather than care. That's being a bit unfair, but we, are, we do tend to think that we're in the cure business when often the people that we're looking after are not going to be cured. A crucial issue is timing. When do we begin end-of-life planning and what do we do at each stage? And this program will explore these issues involved in end-of-life care, particularly in rural and remote Australia. And we'll look at the needs for, that people have approaching the end of life. They have needs for accurate information and pr proper assessment, not just for them and their, their carers as well. We'll also consider the communication process for the patients, carers and the whole team. On our website, there are a number of useful resources available. That's on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, and that's at rhef.com.au. Now let's meet our panel. David Currow has the Chair of Palliative and Supportive Services at Flinders University in South Australia. Welcome, David. Good to be here. David's a Senior Associate Editor of the Journal of Palliative Medicine. He's also a member of the www.caresearch.com.au team. What's that? It's a great website with lots of resources for caregivers, uh, providing care for people at the end of life, for general practitioners and for specialists, for updated information on symptom control, uh, on care planning and a number of other resources that uh, people find invaluable. And we'll have a link to that website uh, on our website, on the rhef.com.au website, um, which you can find after the program. Nikki Fursden began nursing nearly 20 years ago. Her experience for the first 10 years involved working in Sydney in bone marrow transplantation, haematology and oncology. Welcome, Nikki. Welcome. Hello. Nikki is now a specialist palliative care nurse employed in the community-based palliative care service at Clare Holland House in Canberra. She also has a teaching role with respect uh, with the Respecting Patients' Choices program in the ACT. Now, what is that? That's an advanced care um, program looking at advanced care planning um, and teaching people to help others do advanced care plans to plan out what they would like in their lives. How technical a process is that? Mm. It's a, it, it, it takes a bit of time um, and conversations with medical teams or anybody that you have a conversation needing to find out information about um, and it's about documenting your wishes um, and it's also about um, having an enduring power of attorney, uh, an alternate decision maker for you if you are unable to make decisions for yourself. How important is it to have an advanced care plan mm. versus your family kind of knowing what you want to do because you've talked about it with them over the years? Mm. We all think we do talk about these issues with family, but when it comes down to it, um, most of us haven't. Or the family forgets. Or the family forgets, or there's dispute within families. Um, having it documented and having an enduring power of attorney saying that they will respect your wishes um, in, in a timely manner where there's not a crisis um, really, really helps people when crises do happen, we know where to go, we know what to do, we know what their wishes are. But of course general practitioners watching this program and community nurses and pharmacists mm. work in different jurisdictions and there's different mm. rules in different places, isn't there? There certainly are. Um, and if with the Respecting Patient Choices website, it is a national program. If you go onto that website, you can have a look at the different legislation f for each um, state or territory. But most people at a minimum say you should have a formal discussion and well in advance of any terminal illness. Absolutely, yeah, and just having, just knowing what that person wants. Joel Ree is a general practitioner and a conjoint lecturer at the University of New South Wales. He's also an NHMRC PhD scholar with the Centre for Primary Health Care and Equity at the University of New South Wales. Welcome, Joel. Thank you. Joel has a clinical interest in aged care and uh, palliative care in general practice. Last and certainly not least is Wendy Rogers, who's Professor of Clinical Ethics at Macquarie University, who has a long-standing interest in ethical issues in general practice. Welcome, Wendy. Thanks, Norman. What do you think are the ethical issues here, Wendy? Well, I think they fall into two categories, really. There are the ethical issues associated with patient care, which are generalizable across all areas of care, such as 
finding out what the patients want and respecting those choices where possible, which involve honest communication and sort of lack of coercion and manipulation. There's issues to do with minimising suffering and acting in the patient's best interest, promoting welfare. There's issues of equity and resource allocation. And all of those play out in different ways in different fields of medicine. Um, so palliative care raises its own issues there. But then there's also specific issues to do with uh, assisted death probably is the broadest term to use, including things like euthanasia and assisted suicide. So ethicists get a bit concerned about all this, this whole area, worried that putting somebody on morphine might be assisted death. Uh, I don't think the ethicists worry about it. Um, for a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of ethicists are, are quite in favour of euthanasia rather than the reverse. I think practitioners sometimes worry that there's a, a line between providing good care and doing something that might hasten the death of the patient. And we'll come to a lot of these issues um, during the programme. David, we've got end-of-life care, we've got terminal care, we've got palliative care. What does it all mean? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, well, you edit the journal, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Uh, look, I, I think a lot of people get uh, very worried about definitions. Uh, palliative care is in the context of uh, a predictable life-limiting illness. Uh, terminal care and end-of-life care is, is a subset of that and really uh, focuses on the last few hours or few days of life. Um, supportive care is the other term that's used and I think that's uh, again about uh, excellent clinical care irrespective of, uh, of what the future holds, but palliative care is, uh, is where you have someone who has a predictable life-limiting illness and uh, you have a team of, uh, of people, their family, their caregivers, uh, health professionals, including their general practitioner, uh, supporting them through that. But you say, including the general practitioner, most palliative care is done by GPs, isn't it? Absolutely. And but you don't I'm necessarily have to have the palliative care team in. Not at all, but the team is the GP and, and that person's family and, uh, and friends uh, and their community nurse are, are the core members of that team. Nikki, I often hear it said that uh, we're too near the end when we call in or think of end of, care, end of life care planning mm. and, and mm. that management. And some people say, you know, if, you're on a can if you've got cancer, maybe it should start two years beforehand. Yes. Um, and, and I suppose um, at least for some people that, that, will, that will work out. Others um, may feel a bit troubled by having those conversations too early. So it's up to the practitioner to, um, to think when, when the time is necessary. And but how easy is it to f know when you're actually in that last phase? Mm, um, it, it's reasonably easy with, with cancer. Um, it, becomes more problematic with terminal illness, um, sorry, with um, chronic illness. Or so congestive heart failure, yeah. chronic obstructive lung disease. And, and, and something. also dementia can, can bring in So what proportion of your work is cancer versus non-cancer terminal care? Mm, about, at the moment, probably about 60% is still cancer and 40%. Um, I'm not sure if that's in national levels. It, it varies from yeah. practice to practice because so much of this is still referral mm. dependent. Mm. Mm. So somebody, once said, somebody has said that uh, terminal care is saying to yourself as a practitioner, I won't be surprised if this person dies in the next 12 months. That's when you start thinking of end of life care. Mm. Do you agree with that in general practice context? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's hard to, hard to say that because um, first of all, um, to um, predict exactly when the person will die in 12 months or whether it's going to be hard. And secondly, a lot of people also die quite suddenly and, um, and sometimes they can contract the illness that um, takes their life away much sooner than that. Sometimes it can drag on for much longer. Um, I think general practitioners are very good at um, taking care of patients across all walks of life, whether they're young or they're old or whether they're sick or they're healthy. And I think um, it should just be part of uh, what, we, what we do, uh, it should be part of our care to also think about end of life whenever we deal with patients. David, talk to me a little bit about the trajectories of different situations in palliative care because they can be quite different. Absolutely, and I think uh, you know, people have started to map these and to understand them uh, in a far more robust way. Uh, the, the concept that uh, uh, in cancer you may have uh, a plateau phase where your level of function as someone even with advanced cancer is relatively stable. 
uh, but that you may see quite a, a, a sudden decline in, uh, in function. And once you've started to see that decline, uh, you really are challenged by the, um, uh, the, the speed with which that occurs. So, so this is the first chart there, the blue? The yeah. blue. If we look at the blue one, we've, we've got cancer with a, a plateau and a, a very sharp decline. Uh, I think most of us can relate to the, um, the, the, the purple color. Um, uh, as an example, uh, people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, where you get this sawtooth pattern. And I think the two things to note here are that with any one of those exacerbations, the person may die. And that's back to Joel's point that there are some very unpredictable aspects to this. But secondly, and I think really importantly, um, the person never recovers to that same level of performance that they had before that exacerbation. It's a stepwise decline. And, and when you see the, those exacerbations also coming together more frequently uh, with less functional recovery, you can be very clear that unless something is going to change the course of that illness, um, it, things are not good. Uh, and then finally, um, as Nikki has talked about, the, the frail aged and particularly people with dementia uh, are covered here in green where it, there are no dramatic changes um, but uh, a, a gentle and, uh, if you will, fairly uh, uh, predictable uh, decline in function over a long period of time. So what are the goals then of end of life care, David? Well, if we ask patients uh, who are facing the end of life, we get very reproducible answers. Uh, the first and foremost issue is to make sure that they have good symptom control. And that's not just about pain. Uh, I think, w again, we think of uh, palliative care as cancer, of pain. Uh, in fact, uh, fatigue and dyspnea are, are really big symptoms for many people. Um, uh, things like uh, insomnia, nausea, uh, are things that, that change dramatically at this time in people's lives. So good physical symptom control is the door through which you can then start to offer uh, the other things that are important at the end of life, such as um, uh, finalizing relationships, finalizing business affairs, um, making right uh, relationships that have uh, not been terribly good over the years. I mean, who of us wouldn't have a couple of phone calls to make if we uh, weren't going to see Christmas this year? Um, so they're the goals that patients have. Do you often see a transformation in people when they die, or you die as you live? Usually you, you die as you live. So um, we see uh, cranky people getting more cranky, um, and calm people becoming calm. Calmer. So it's not necessarily <laughs> a, a revolution where you're going to make up no, with everybody. No. <laughs> but it does give some, people some that Some people do have, have a coming to peace within themselves. So what I'm hearing then is probably more so than in other medical or specialties is, if you call it a medical specialty, is um, you're much more placed in where the patient's at and what they mm. want rather than you imposing your own plan. That's correct and also the family is, a, is the unit of care. So it's not just, just the patient, we care about the families and, and, and no the family? carers. And if there's no family, um, which is we, increasingly the case, it, it is increasingly the case. Um, we just have to do the best we can with the resources we have. There's some good volunteer programs and things like that, what which we do. Yeah. What can you do about fatigue, Joel? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's a very difficult symptom. I mean, nausea and fatigue are the two things that really, if you survey people, I understand that really say that bothers them, particularly when they're having chemo and so on. Yeah, I think um, it's a very hard symptom to treat medically. Um, David would have, you know, more. Um, expert opinion on that, but uh, from personal experience dealing with patients who's fatigued, um, I think it helps to be very supportive and I think it helps um, to have family members and other carers who understand that they're fatigued and although they can get rest and they can sleep, um, it may not alleviate this fatigue. So, Because um, it's like a fog more than a fatigue. Yeah, it's, um, it just seems to be one of those things where, um, yeah, you just um, even even if you end up sleeping 23 hours a day, you may still end up fatigued. Um, yeah, but I think having an un understanding family members, having um, explaining to the patient why they're fatigued, um, also um, doing simple things around their lives um, to make things easier for them, um, so that they don't have to exert more energy. I, I think these things can help along with some medications as well. David. 
I think at the end of the day, uh, rest doesn't cure this fatigue, and it's one of the diagnostic criteria for it, really. Um, one of the most important things is to actually have a conversation with that person and their family. You know, families will often say, if only they got out of bed and did a bit more, uh, you know, and, and that's to help families. That's to help them feel better. Um, and, uh, you know, I put it to, to, uh, to patients in this circumstance, you have less energy to spend. How do you want to invest that? If you, you know, if you had a dollar of energy to spend every day of your life and now you've got 10 cents, how are you going to spend that? How is it hard? Are we talking about something that's a bit soft and fluffy or have we got evidence behind some of this? Uh, it would be nice to, to simply dismiss well, it as no, soft. criticizing what you're saying, uh, Professor Curran, you know. <laughs> soft and fluffy. We've got a great evidence base. The fact that we may not necessarily always use it uh, is, uh, is, is much more the challenge, and that's not unique to palliative care. Uh, we see it right across clinical practice. Um, there's a strong evidence base behind uh, much of what uh, can occur to help patients to help their families uh, and at a health service level to, uh, to understand the impact of good palliative care. Uh, Joel, I, I've seen good palliative care in practice mm -hmm. and it really is quite impressive when a palliative care nurse or a palliative care physician comes in, they kind of know about, they know about symptom control and they do things with drugs that are quite amazing and they, they know what causes what. To me that feels quite technical and uh, has a knowledge base and whilst people are pushing GPs to do more and more in palliative care, is there a technical skill gap, technical knowledge gap here that GPs have to upscale to? I mean, yeah, there's no doubt that uh, there's a lot of um, things that uh, David and other specialists know that uh, GPs wouldn't be expected to know. There's a lot of um, accumulated information and expertise as, you know, that um, specialists have. Um, but I think even with lesser skill base, um, GPs can deliver effective palliative care. And, um, and there is a little bit of technical um, knowledge which um, could be, that GPs could gain. And, th and there are some programs which they can actually attend um, to gain some of these skills. Um, there's a PEPA program, for instance, that runs across, um, I think, most states and territories that um, GPs can actually attend um, to gain extra um, clinical experience in palliative care. Um, yeah, but um, I think even with, um, you know, just um, uh, good support from palliative care specialists and nursing staff, um, GPs can deliver effective palliative care. Nikki, what are the main issues that need to be taken into account? We're kind of skirmished with them, but when mm. you're doing end of, care, end of life end. care management planning. Right. Um, we need to know what the values a, a person has about what, what, what it means to live well for a person. It's... Um, it's not useful to say maybe I don't want to have that medication or I don't want to be intubated or those sort of things it's because um, situations may come up of you might need to have an appendectomy and therefore you need to be intubated but it doesn't mean you're going to die from that so looking at the values what do you value in life what couldn't you live without um, and having those conversations with people. So it can ac actually be done with well people. And, it, and it's also a changing process. But, but that's advanced care planning rather than end of life planning. I mean, we're talking about oh, you're doing sorry, your management Norman. at the end of life care. That's really what I'm I was trying sorry, to get Norman. at in terms of the issues that you need to consider. I mean, obviously, mm. those are some of them because mm. you can't make some dis management decisions unless you know that kind of mm. stuff about mm. what people value. Sure. Um, so, talking about end of life care, um, it's really important to have a, a very trusting relationship with you and the patient um, and also good collaboration with the GPs and any other supporting specialists um, because people when they're very sick don't need to be co coordinating their care. So that's really our job to, to make that work well for them and for them to trust us. Wendy, what do you think the main issues are? I think we've covered some of them already in terms of honesty and um, having a trusting relationship really because people at the end of life, many people apparently find it terrifying um, and I can't say I'm looking forward to it. Um, but it's being able to have those conversations, being able to say, you know, what can you do to help me and uh, what, what can happen if I can't bear it um, is a question I'm sure that you get sometimes, both Nikki and David. Mm -hmm. um, being able to provide compassionate care that meets the needs as well as one can um, inside the law and um, I think there's also a resource allocation with palliative care in a couple of ways. I think 
there's still a bias we've already heard mentioned towards cancer patients because they die in a more predictable way, whereas so they get more palliative care than people perhaps with the chronic diseases, the cardiac failure and the COPDs and so on. Um, and then there's also issues, I think, where people get overtreated at the end of life, perhaps when they don't really want to be, but they're caught up on the medical treadmill. And so a lot of resources go to people who are actually dying, but that hasn't been recognised or admitted by their carers. Joel, how important is the whole notion of prognosis in this sort of end of life care from either the practitioner's point of view or indeed the patients and caregivers? Yeah, obviously it's a very important, important issue. We're um, pretty bad at prognosis. Yeah, and it's, it's hard. Um, I think um, of the times when we try to make a prediction, a firm prediction on how long they've got to live, often we're wrong. Um, so it's, it is hard. But I think and we it's can... it's often overestimated rather than underestimated. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but I think still um, you can have a reasonable understanding of what the prognosis is going to be like. For instance, um, if they're likely to um, pass away in the you know, next um, few months or they're likely to continue for longer. And, and I think um, communicating this prognostic information is very important to the patients. Um, you've got to use common sense and, and be reasonable and take into account the person's situation as well and their understanding of their illness. And what, what if the son says to you, I don't want my dad to know? Yeah, that throws up um, some ethical issues. Um, in the end, it is the, it is the patient um, who, 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 who um, who is um, the person who's suffering from the illness. Um, so we, we shouldn't forget that. But um, I think there's always going to be ethical issues in terms of whether it's going to be beneficial or whether it's going to be detrimental to someone's health to tell them the prognosis. And in certain cultures, I think, um, you know, that... that um, but, but David, presumably that can be solved by a conversation with the person themselves, can't it? In some, in some ways? Yeah, look, um, uh, I was... Uh, um, offered the opportunity to be torn limb, limb from limb by a, a family who said, you know, if you tell our mother what's happening, uh, we will take you out and physically beat you to a pulp. Um, that was, uh, that does concentrate your mind. Yeah, that's um, been poor Adelaide support. Yeah, that's right. Um, the, it was actually interesting. It took us three quarters of an hour to negotiate, uh, but eventually I, I got permission from the family with them there, and I think that's important. Uh, to actually ask the mother what she thought was going on. And uh, her answer is one I've heard many times. I have cancer and I'm sick of the fact that no one will talk to me about it. She answered the question herself. We provided no information. Out of the, uh, out of the thing. Uh, what are the biggest myths, do you think, David? Oh, the biggest single myth is really simple. You tell someone that they've got a life-limiting illness and everyone assumes they're going to become nice. Um, it's not true. It's as simple as that. Um, but, but isn't it also, well, I'm a palliative care doctor, that means you're here to either kill me or I'll die tomorrow? Yes, that's right. And, and I think there's a great fear and uh, uh, a myth around that. I, I think there's also uh, a myth that, that people will accept death. And clearly that's not the case. In fact, uh, you know, many of us are not going to accept uh, death when, when we're given that information. Tell me this fascinating study that you did in the ACT of consciousness and unconsciousness nearer to, nearer to the time of death. Mm, it was um, a, a colleague, Dr. Michael Barbado, in 2003, did a study um, where he put EEG, um, what would you call them? Uh, monitors. Monitors um, on, uh, on um, uh, about 12 patients and, and had a look at, at what happened when they were administered subcutaneous either morphine or midazolam, um, and what actually happened to their, their conscious level. Um, giving the medication subcutaneously didn't ever drop um, their levels down to a place where they would die from that medication. It also showed that um, all of those patients had periods where they, their conscious level increased just prior to, they, to death, even though they were all on continuous syringe drivers having been sedated. And I think there were a couple of uh, who weren't mm. on any medications mm. at all. Right. And, and we saw exactly the same mm. pattern. Mm. 
um, for, uh, for those people. So on no medications that were causing sedation, these are people who'd lost consciousness at the end of life, mm. and you saw an identical pattern to those who were on low and, doses of benzodiazepines. And the suspicions that people are aware of what's going on in the room were mm. borne out, weren't mm. they? Absolutely. The um, conscious level actually went up a little bit with family members in the room, but not with staff. Um, so there was a, a level of knowing that there was someone in the room that they, they loved and cared about. And this Hollywood notion of waking up a bit before you die is actually real? Certainly from um, bispectral monitoring, it was surprisingly real in mm. all but, I, I think, one person. Mm. Um, and uh, whether that, was, that correlated with um, the family realising that or whether it was just uh, on a uh, signal average EEG, but it's a fascinating observation. What do you think are the rural issues here? Because obviously the GP is more in a primary care team rather than having palliative care necessarily on tap. Yeah, I think um, not having the specialist um, palliative care um, either medically or in, in many cases nursing uh, support as well, that's going to be a big issue. Um, it's probably easy to feel um, like you're left um, by yourself and without support. Um, but I think there's also um, advantages being rural as well because um, often the GPs would have access to the hospital as a VMO and um, it actually, I think it, that can really facilitate um, caring for patients towards some um, end of life. And presumably there's phone advice available. Always phone advice. I, I mean, I think the other big aspect is that, that so often the general practitioner in rural practice will have contact with this person who's dying with lots of other hats on. You know, at the, the Parents and Teachers Association or uh, the football club. Um, so there's an intimacy there which, um, which means that people really do have to look at how they can care for themselves as practitioners while they're looking after close friends. Let's just take a, a couple of questions uh, from North Queensland. To, how, how is the best way to give symptom management to someone who has terminal end-stage pulmonary fibrosis with a feeling of oxygen starvation? Mm. One of the most frightening symptoms that we can uh, ever encounter and the feeling that each breath will be your last um, is, is just the most horrible sensation. Um, if uh, hypoxia has been dealt with, um, with oxygen and certainly that's something that may well worsen as death approaches and, uh, and oxygen may need to be adjusted in that setting but um, you know, there is a, a role for low-dose opioids, perhaps uh, sustained release opioids uh, once a day for those preparations that can be given once a day. And that, that's, that has a physiological effect, that relaxes the vascular bed a bit? And well, not only that, it, it appears uh, from, from very recent uh, research out of the United States that uh, our endogenous uh, endorphins are really important at, at uh, managing breathlessness from, from exercise. So if you block them, uh, what you get is the same workload, but uh, a, a markedly increased sense of, uh, of work uh, at breathing. So clearly opioids have a role uh, centrally uh, as part of uh, our understanding of uh, their mechanism. And the second question is, when is the best time to start discussion about organising an advanced care plan? Uh, as this is a delicate subject, especially if never discussed mm. before, Nikki? Well, I've got one myself. Anybody, have you? I do. Anybody can have an advanced care plan. Um, so, as a practitioner, if, if we're seeing a per person coming into our service who hasn't got an advanced care plan, any time really would be appropriate to bring it up. It's about the relationship you have with that person. You wouldn't do it on the first meeting. You'd like to have a bit of rapport um, and so that they, you can talk openly and honestly. Let's go to uh, one of our case studies this evening. John's 66 years old. He lives in uh, Joel's country town and has smoked heavily since he was 16. He's had numerous admissions for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease over the years and he's just been admitted for the fourth time in three months for an exacerbation. He's got a wife and three kids and following the admission his condition declines rapidly. You're a patient, Joel. Yeah, so John um, is in strife. Um, I think just from the history um, with progression of his COPD um, which has been chronically probably declining over the years and with recent um, uh, fourth exacerbation in three months, um, John is facing real risk of death I think um, and as we saw in the previous graph which uh, David sort of mentioned, 
um, one of these exacerbations may be the one that actually takes John's life. And um, even if he doesn't, over the next few years, he'll be continuously deteriorating, and I, th I think he'll be in strife. Um, Very hard to prognosticate, though. Yeah, I mean, the question is whether if he survives this uh, exacerbation, how long would John go for? And, and that's a hard question, obviously. You know, that will depend on things like FEV1 and, and, and other things as well, um, whether he's got other chronic diseases or, and, uh, you know, a variety of other things. But, um, yeah, he's um, not in a good shape at the moment. So what are you going to do for him? Yeah, I think um, you need to sort of talk to John about uh, his situation, I think. You need to um, get an idea of what John thinks about his illness, uh, whether he views uh, this illness as something that's... Um, uh, just a chronic illness and he'll just continue on but he'll always recover from these exacerbations or whether he, he actually knows what, what may happen to him in the future. Um, aside from that, obviously, the current exacerbation is another problem. Um, the standard treatment which we can give him would include things like giving him antibiotics, the steroids, the oxygen, mm. bronchodilators and things like that. But a big question is what do we do if he deteriorates um, in terms of level of care? do we um, send John off to a tertiary referral hospital to be uh, intubated and ventilated if it comes down to that? Or what do we do with that? I, th I think that's a big question that needs to be asked. And some ethical issues in there as well. They certainly are because um, the burdens of care are quite different. If, if John is on a downward trajectory and is going to die either this admission or the next admission or the one after, if he gets sent down to a tertiary institution for his terminal care, that's very expensive in terms of healthcare costs, uh, but he'd looked up, be looked after by professionals, perhaps sparing his family. But if he's looked after at home, it'll be the burden will fall probably on his wife as the main carer, and she may or may not be able to support that, and she may or may not be able to be supported in that role. So I think there's definitely some issues there. And there's some issues too about even if he does want to go to a tertiary care institution and be ventilated, his doctors aren't obliged to provide treatment if they don't think it will actually be in his best interest in the long run or change his prognosis. So there are some hard decisions for the doctor, I think, as well as for John. Mm. And there's, there's a third option too, if he decides not to have any treatment, any active treatment at all, but to just choose palliative care. Um, and palliative care is not no treatment, it is, is a lot of treatment. Um, it's just different. And it's about so what would palliative care treatment for, for John look like? What mm. would be involved? So it would involve um, treating his symptoms of dyspnea, um, probably... A so almost like the story a moment ago with pulmonary yeah, fibrosis? that's right, yeah, and, and anxiety and also looking at um, his family's capacity to maybe support him at home. So are there ways of systematically assessing caregivers' capacity and how they're coping and so on? Yeah, I'll let David talk about that one. Clearly there are and uh, you know there's no doubt that uh, the health system, the social system relies really heavily on family caregivers. Uh, by way of investment um, uh, for every dollar we spend uh, uh, nationally on health we're probably uh, at the same time spending 50 cents of uh, family uh, and caregiver uh, resources across our community. We need to understand uh, the needs of, of this person both while in the role and I think importantly after they've relinquished the role of end of life care because there's a huge hangover effect of health um, detriment from, uh, from being a caregiver in this setting. So there are a number of ways that, that we can assess but we, we need to provide the same level of care and attention to detail for the caregivers uh, as we do for the patient. Joel, is it sometimes harder to convince caregivers um, of the seriousness of a situation when it's not cancer? Yeah, I think um, we're still suffering from um, age-old sort of thing where the cancer is um, considered terminal and um, some of the other chronic conditions like a um, bit of lung, a bit of chronic bronchitis, a um, bit of asthma, um, these kind of things are sort of looked down upon as nothing too serious, a uh, touch of sugar. Um, and um, I think both the patient and the caregiver can often... Um, yeah, consider this condition and, and the situation to be not too serious. Um, the person maybe will just bounce back and he'll be good as, good as new. Have we missed the boat with John? Or should it have been six months ago? Well, we're talking about someone who six months ago was coming into hospital every few months. In the last three months, he's come in four times. 
um, I think that uh, that tells us that the time is right now. That, that having that conversation two years ago may not have been a, a terribly productive conversation, but uh, uh, perhaps after his last hospital admission rather than on this presentation. What do you do about somebody who is clearly terminal, living by themselves and doesn't want any care, kind of shut the do shuts the door to die? What do you do about that? It can be a very problematic situation and one that brings up lots of ethical issues in terms of our um, duty of care um, and it brings up lots of personal worries, I suppose, with how we're going to care for this person. Um, we do have to value their opinion, though, if they're competent. If they're not competent, that takes in a, a whole different scenario. But if they're competent, we can't really push someone into accepting care. Or, um, so I suppose in Canberra we're fairly lucky because we do have quite a lot of resources so we might get a volunteer to go and stay the night or um, call in family members or things like that if we possibly can. But in the end if they've got their marbles and fully awake, Wendy, it's their choice as an adult. It's their choice as an adult and to take them into hospital against their will or give them treatment would be assault or battery. Um, I think it's interesting that sometimes people are deemed competent if they comply with medical care and incompetent if they don't. And there's always a, um, a, a, perhaps an inclination to, to sort of play the competence card if a patient is refusing any treatment when it seems irrational to be doing so. But peop some people would prefer... So if somebody has refused care, shut the door on the professionals, albeit this is a minority situation, don't want to make too much of it, um, and then they become incompetent, they lose consciousness. What's, what are the, uh, what's the medical team duty bound to do ethically? I think if you've Nothing? got a, no, no, if you've got a patient who's incompetent, who's in, who's in urgent need of care, so for example they're in pain or they're um, dehydrated or something like that, then there's a, a duty of rescue in that situation. But I think you wanted, one would do well to honour their previous wishes as much as possible. So you wouldn't take that person in and, you know, give them very intensive resuscitation, for example, if you knew that they'd shut the door because they were fed up with life and wanted to die. So you, you would take them and make them comfortable and hopefully let them die in, in a, a caring environment rather than on their own. Joel, at what point would you be referring, John, if at all, to palliative care, specialist palliative care? Yeah. If, if it was available for you in your country town? Yeah, I think um, it, it really depends on a few factors. I think it depends on the skills I have, which is uh, obviously if I feel a bit slightly out of depth and if I require um, some expert advice, and I have called on specialist palliative care advice over the years, and, and, and they've been very, very helpful. Um, that's uh, one, one uh, situation where I'd refer. Um, other situation would be if John... Um, deteriorates further and if standard medical treatment, if the path John has taken and the path we have decided to take is towards a more symptom relief uh, path and not so much towards um, uh, maximizing quantity of life path and, um, and if we need some extra advice and services from, from the palliative care services then I definitely refer. Much of this uh, also depends on technical expertise. So um, things like syringe drivers, uh, which the palliative care services could provide, I, I, I may not have the skills to put that in. And, if and it's that's a source of error as well if you don't know how to use them properly. Yes, yes. Hmm. So let's move on to um, another story. June is 74 years old. She lives alone. She's a widow. Um, she lives in the same town with access to her GP, Joel, and the hospital. She's been diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer and with uh, stage 4 liver metastases and they were there at diagnosis. She's elected not to have any adjuvant therapy. She has a long history of uh, obstructive lung disease and had an, had an MI a few years ago but doesn't have any residual cardiac problems. She's got two grown-up children, both of whom live away from the town. Her husband died three years ago and since then she's really become pretty isolated. At the time her lung cancer was diagnosed, uh, June was functioning pretty well, looking after herself, but really doesn't have anybody locally to help or support her. Joel? Yeah, June's, um, she's obviously um, got a serious disease that's likely to take her life. Uh, she's got uh, non-small cell lung cancer which, um, with uh, liver mets, which uh, she's elected not to have any therapy. And, um, 
I think her lifespan's um, probably going to be over the next few months. Um, she'll likely to uh, decline. I think the situation is, uh, in terms of her symptoms, she doesn't seem to have any symptoms. Um, I think, though, that we can expect her to start getting symptoms later on. Uh, so it's something that we should be prepared for. Um, should she be prepared for it? I think so, too, yeah. I think everybody should be prepared for it. Um, it, it also, I think... But presumably, if we follow the principles we've enunciated earlier, mm. It's only if she wants to know, presumably. It's, you, you find out what she needs, wants to know, needs to know. Precisely, yeah. I think you need to work out where she is with her diagnosis, whether she um, understands the situation at the moment. So, so when you talk to her, hmm. she's profoundly depressed. And it's hard to know how much of it is a reaction to her diagnosis and how much of it is grief for her husband or just melancholia. The refusal of treatment might have a lot to do with that melancholia. Yeah, and um, depression can um, obviously cloud the judgment. Although you can't, you can't always say that um, just because someone's depressed means that they're incapable of making own decisions. I think. But they might make different decisions if their mood lifted. True, and I think um, you need to actually assess her um, mood. Um, you also need to work out whether it's just a um, normal grief reaction that she's going through within the spectrum of normality um, or whether she's um, having suffering from clinical depression and um, that could be a judgment call in the end. Um, it may not be too straightforward. She may, she's 74 as well, she's fairly old and she may have atypical symptoms of depression as well. So says a young lad. <laughs> <laughs> Get close to it, you might change your mind there, Joe. 74 is the new 50, isn't it? That's what I understand. Yeah. That's right. well, she's got no support. What are you going no. to do for that, Nikki? No, she doesn't have any support. Although we, we can ring her family. Maybe they would come. Um, people do end up mm. coming you know, when, when their family's in strife. Um, but she doesn't want to ring them. She doesn't want to She doesn't them. want to ring them, no. And she doesn't want you to tell them. Mm. I suppose with talking with her and asking her what the goals of her care would be, if she wanted to stay at home, we'd need to say, it's very hard for you to be here on your own. Would you let us contact someone so that you could stay at home rather than transferring you or something like that? So she's lost the joie de vivre. She hasn't got social contacts and she says to you, mm. I just want to die as quickly as possible. What can you do to help mm. me? It's really important to try and explore behind what she's saying to you um, and it's interesting people will often say that they um, would like euthanasia and it's a part of our job I suppose to work out what is happening for them that is making life so hard and is it something we could help with is it something that's reversible is, is it depression um, and can we make a difference so because it's not actually legal for us to help her so d depression treatment, so do medications work in this situation, David? Well, the, the issue is, um, you asked about myths a bit earlier, um, clinical depression is no more frequent in this population than the population at large walking through uh, a general practitioner's front door. So if we do make the diagnosis of clinical depression, we need to respond to that. And, uh, you know, we need to distinguish that clearly from, uh, from sadness, but if we've made the, the, uh, the uh, diagnosis, then uh, yes, it's we do need to behavioral treat. It's therapy, it's medication, whatever. Yeah. How do you make sure she really understands what's going on? Because as Wendy says, um, that appreciation is what gives you your autonomy. Yeah, I think um, it's uh, partly GPs are at an advantage, I think, because of our long-term relationship with the patient. Um, often the GPs would know that would have known the patient for a long time and they may know their um, the patient's style and, and that, that how they normally make decisions and, and their style of autonomy that's not to say that just because they've always acted in a particular way that you can take um, this mm. particular instance to be the same um, but I think it gives us a head start I think in the end it's going to be a frank long discussion with the patient about um, and not just on one occasion yeah, over, over a period of time about, um, and in June's case, we may have a period of weeks to months to actually have a long discussion with her. So over the next six months, uh, you, Joel got the community care nurse in, and, uh, but June has had increasing difficulty from breathlessness 
and needs really support to stay at home. What are you going to do for her now? Yeah. Um, of course, this isn't a sudden situation. It hasn't it's crept up on you. Yeah, so that we have a symptom issue now in terms of her increasing dyspnea. And, and, and the second issue is um, something that we expected before, which is um, lack of support. Um, I think we need to, um, in terms of getting support, we need to actually start thinking about other options for her. Um, it's quite predictable what's going to happen with June, I think. I mean, it, it could be that she takes the turn for the worse and over the next um, few months she could develop a complication like a pulmonary embolus or something like that that takes her life. But by and large, she'll be likely to deteriorate over the next few months and um, she's going to need more support. And I think that it's going to be harder and harder to manage at home for June. And we need to have another frank discussion with her about the need to actually um, consider going into higher level facilities. Um, that doesn't maybe need to happen right now, but it may need to happen very soon. So June's not the slightest bit interested in going into residential aged care. She wants to be at home. That's where her husband was. What are you going to do about her breathlessness? Well, I think breathlessness, there's a lot of, or well, several options available. Um, it, it's not an easy symptom. Um, and I think being from gender, from gender practitioners, point of view, um, we're not used to managing um, uh, dyspnea in, in a palliative um, care sort of way. Um, but I think there are medication op options such as um, opioids or um, anxiolytics and other things which we could use and David maybe could. And oxygen's only got limited value, hasn't it? Oxygen's great if you haven't got enough oxygen. It's wonderful stuff. Um, but if, uh, you're, uh, if you're not a hypoxemic, then uh, the, ad the additional benefit is probably no more than air blowing across your, uh, your face. So um, I, I think we, we need to measure the right things with oxygen, and one of them is, is caregiver um, uh, reassurance. They can do something when this person is, uh, is short of breath. Mm. So, sorry, did you want to say something? Nikki? Oh, I just think um, it would be highly likely that she'd had, have a, a high level of anxiety that um, would need to be addressed, whether it's with medication or... Um, Again, the low-dose opiates or something like that. Yeah, or, uh, yes. So June's now started to lose weight, Joel. She's uh, got quite a lot of pain in her right upper quadrant and it's getting worse and she's nauseous and the community nurse really needs to come in twice a day to check up on her. Mm. Yeah, so she's um, getting more symptoms. Um, she's losing weight, which is um, often a sign of decline. Um, and uh, she's um, also her um, support needs are increasing. In terms she's of nearing the end. Yes, um, heading towards that way, I think. Um, in terms of symptoms, there are a few things which you could try. I, I think it's important to work out where the pain is coming from. Uh, and there are several causes for nausea. Um, uh, and you need to explore. I think it's important to explore where the nausea is coming from instead of just um, giving her the Mexilon, um, just standard the Mexilon every time we see nausea. But maybe worthwhile just trying to work out whether it's maybe coming from um, uh, set more central causes which um, may respond better to haloperidol or something like that as opposed to um, Maxilon, uh, whether it's, um, there's any um, liver distensions causing extra pressure on the stomach, causing a bit of a squashy stomach kind of thing. Or, uh, so you need to work out where nausea is coming from. Same as pain, I think it's important to take a good pain history. Um, and that can often be neglected, I think, in settings of um, uh, end of life where you sort of think, well, pain's pain and let's treated with opioids, I think it's worthwhile finding out exactly what sort of pain it is. Um, so if it's it. liver capsule pain? Yeah, liver capsule pain, um, I think, responds quite well to, and David can correct me, but it responds quite well to dexamethasone. Um, so that's uh, one thing which you could use, apart from other opioids and, and other medications as well. Um, but yeah, dexamethasone, dexamethasone might be good for nausea uh, as well. Might help her appetite. Mm. 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 What is the treatment for cachexia? Um, mostly to protect patients from their families, uh, well-meaning families who want to feed them. Uh, you know, if only they'd eat, they'd get stronger. If only they'd eat, they'd have more energy. And uh, really, other than reversing the underlying cause, the, the heart failure, um, the respiratory failure, the cancer, uh, cachexia 
uh, is not going to be reversed. It is a catabolic state, and uh, more food, more calories uh, doesn't reverse it. Uh, so, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I spend a fair bit of clinical time uh, trying to protect um, patients from very well-meaning, loving families because food is such a social thing that we enjoy. So, and have you got any ethical concerns at this point, Wendy? Um, with June, uh, I think, well, but partly there's the resource issues again, as I've mentioned, whether she can be supported to stay at home, whether she'll be carted off to hospital against her will. Um, those are the main ones at the moment. I'm not sure what her level of understanding is at this stage, but if she's starting to lose weight and feeling frailer... And, and presumably, if you haven't had that end-of-life discussion with her, kind of knows the time if she wants to hear it. Yeah, I think... But what she wants done. Yeah, of course. And, and I think the other issue is she's needing twice-a-day support. And you just... I'm sort of worried that she's deteriorating so fast that um, she's not going to get the dignity level of dignity that she deserves um, at home. Um, it's one thing, it is very important to listen to pe people's wishes and that's the whole point of what we've been discussing but at the same time we've got a duty of care to actually look after the patient's world as well. And um, if she's um, not coping at all with twice daily visits then I think I'll have a conversation with her and I don't really think it's wrong for us to um, talk to patients about um, maybe changing their mind. Um, I think if it is values which are worthwhile changing, and we have these sort of discussions all the time about the need to have a healthy lifestyle. People don't want to have a healthy lifestyle, but we ask them, you know, it's good for your body, have a healthy lifestyle, good to eat less um, junk food and good to eat um, better food. And same situation may go in June's case, where I know she wants to really stay at home and we want to respect that, but maybe her d reality of her illness is robbing us of that opportunity. Mm. Yeah. The biggest single predictor of being able to stay at home for terminal care is having uh, caregivers. Uh, and that's not one caregiver, that's caregivers with a it's network a team, of support yeah. uh, be behind them. And right around the world, that's the strongest single predictor independent of everything else. And for June, her chances of staying home, uh, even with volunteers, um, without uh, dedicated family members there, it's going to be tough. So June is admitted to hospital, and the first night you get a call, Joel, because you're on call, 2 o'clock in the morning, she's yelling and uh, confused. Yeah, so... Um, and she's not been demented before this, she's as bright as a button. Yeah, it's um, distressing for everyone. Uh, so it's what is it? Look, it's delirium, um, it's acute confusional state, um, and it's probably triggered by the fact that she was admitted into the hospital, um, a new environment, um, but also whatever's triggered her to, ad to be admitted, so the fact that she's been having progression of disease, the fact that her symptoms have been getting much worse, maybe there were some um, medical reasons, underlying reasons, which made her develop that delirium now. Um, I sp yeah, so I think it's um, delirium and um, it should be managed. Um, and there's several ways which we could manage that. But I think um, the first thing to do is to basically um, um, uh, address the anxiety and, and, and um, distress associated with the whole situation. So you're sitting sort of major sedation? Well, I mean, physical um, sedation is considered, well, it's not a, I don't think it's a, it's the last, absolute last resort. And chemical restraint, I suppose, is... Um, uh, a better way of doing things. So I think um, that would be the way to go initially. Um, but the use of things like haloperidol have been quite criticised in this sort of situation, antipsychotics. What's the situation here from the evidence base, David? Uh, the evidence base is that we don't have much evidence either way for antipsychotics, despite the fact that they're widely used in acute confusional states, not just in palliative care, but right across the clinical things. spectrum. Um, I, I think, you know, at 2 a.m. what we need to do is create a safe environment for this woman and for the other people uh, in the hospital, the staff uh, and the other patients, and uh, uh, look for reversible causes, uh, look for uh, uh, you know, medications which may have uh, 
uh, have precipitated this, the change in environment? Uh, does she have cerebral disease that has been unrecognized till now? Is and she constipated? Yeah, that's right. Is she constipated with the eyeballs? Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, let's look at those things in, in the morning, uh, make sure she doesn't have a urinary tract infection that has precipitated this, um, and uh, then put a care plan together that uh, can deal with this in, in the future. But a safe environment tonight is the primary goal. That's pretty scary. Very scary. For the how person. Far, how far would you go with that, David? So if she was delirious again the following night, would you be looking at a terminal sedation situation? Look, uh, I, I think... It's okay in the day and, and delirious at night. Absolutely not a terminal sedation uh, uh, scenario, uh, Wendy. I think we need to be really careful. I think there is sedation at the end of life when people are losing consciousness and, and may have a degree of agitation at that time where sedation may have a place to, to play. Uh, you're telling me that this woman is perfectly well during the day and, and this is not an environment where you would look at... Uh, at that sort of sedation. Uh, back to Nikki's earlier example, uh, you know, that sort of sedation, uh, if used judiciously, means that a person can still wake and interact with, with family, uh, can still uh, have conversations that are important at the end of life, um, and certainly will, will not be affecting uh, uh, prognosis as, as such. So, um, again, it, it is about getting the right balance. So if this is a country hospital, what should the GP and the nurses be organising in terms of her general care? Mm. Um, if we think that she is in the last days of life, um, we need to make sure that the symptom management is, look at, look at all her symptoms, her nausea, um, her constipation, look at anything that we can reverse. And I think that's it's just a point I wanted to make a bit, a bit earlier, is that... Um, just because people are under palliative care, it doesn't mean we can reverse the, the reversible, something simple like a UTI or something. So we, we always look at all those things first and then um, look at symptom management. And I think at this stage, um, subcutaneous medication is probably the way to go um, and keep her comfortable, very regular mouth care, keep her warm, dry, com you know, the things that um, any of us would think would be a dignified way of living. So after deteriorating for about 10 days, she really does cling on, um, she dies. Um, do we know what to do at death? I mean, is that sort of stuff we know or not? Yeah, it's, um, I think um, it's not an easy situation for families um, and uh, the loved ones. So I think it's um, important to support them at this time. Um, and. Um, I think there's also a difference between death in the hospital uh, versus in the community. Um, the first time I got called to a death outside was uh, quite different to having deaths in the hospital where you sort of, the nurses would know what to do most of the time and, and um, um, as a doctor we sort of um, signed a de a death certificate and the, maybe the cremation certificate if they require that um, and just make sure the families and relatives are notified. In the community it's quite different um, in that um, we often are the ones, as in the general practitioners, are the ones who often have to do most of this. Um, and just making sure that the family knows what to do with the body, um, as in calling the funeral director and, 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 and all that afterwards, that's also um, an important thing to do. Yeah. How does the story change, just this palliative care, end of life care story change when it's somebody from an indigenous community? Well, um, the, the most obvious change is that we're, we're looking at uh, a group of people who are dying much younger than the rest of the community. Uh, we're looking at people who are dying of chronic complex diseases more than cancer. Um, but we're still looking at someone who uh, is dying as they live, who will have their views as to what is important to them with the knowledge that time is now limited. And uh, as with everyone in palliative care, we need to understand where this person is up to. And not making the assumptions and that they want to go back to country or Absolutely. Mm. Uh, the, the other complication can be that, uh, as we see with, with many other communities around the world, uh, the decision making may not rest entirely with that person or, or even with that person at all. It may be their community uh, or their uh, extended family who make their clinical decisions and that can require 
time-consuming negotiations at times. It also requires proper infrastructure as well if you need to have 20 or 30 people in the room mm -hmm. and also if there are certain purposes for which that room cannot be used if a person's died in it. So there, there are some quite significant structural and organisational mm. issues as well to consider. Mm. Sorry, Nikki. So yeah, having yeah. an Aboriginal liaison or an Aboriginal health worker working with you on this could be a useful cultural translation. Crucial. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I, I was just going to bring up another point about when someone dies and it, it's an important part of our work and that is that of the bereaved. And it's, a, it's part of our job to um, assess families as we're going along to see if anyone's got any complex grief that they may need referral on. So what about different situations now? Like, do you ever get in a situation where you need palliative care, end of life care, that's not delivered in the intensive care. I mean, you think intensive care units, that's, um, people die in intensive care mm. units at very high rates, but mm. is that the place for end of life care that doesn't happen? Um, interestingly, one of the advanced care plans I did was for a patient who ended up in intensive care, and intensive care only took that person because they had an advanced care plan. And um, when they did arrest after having a pleurodesis, um, they were let die within the intensive care unit and they weren't resuscitated. Um, again, it's about the conversations and doing the best you can in those units because people do die in those units. What's been your experience? Here? It varies from intensive care to intensive care. They're quite idiosyncratic uh, wards of, uh, of many teaching hospitals and uh, some of them do it fantastically well. Uh, some of them really struggle to meet uh, the most basic needs of uh, particularly their dying patients. What's the story, give me just very briefly because we're running out of time now, but give me the story about reduced capacity, particularly where you're not sure what the person wants, you've come in late and there seems to be a conflict with what the family wants and what, in one direction or another, do nothing so we can get the <laughs> inheritance or whatever, but or do everything and you kind of suspect that's not what the person wanted, but you're mm. not quite sure. Joel, how do you approach that situation? Yeah, I think um, if you've got a suspicion, I think um, there's got to be some reason why you have a suspicion. Um, and I think that's a starting point. Um, I think it's um, important to take a step back and, and think to yourself that the reason why we are doing all of this is, first of all, um, to deliver medical care which the patient wants to have. And secondly, also to look out for patient's best interest. And I think these are competing, sometimes they can be in competition, but I think most of the time they actually um, go hand in hand. And I think having those things in the back of your mind while you actually approach um, the actual family's um, wishes, what they want done with the patient, and then looking but at... But isn't the patient the best person to know what their interests are? Of course. So you we're talking about diminished capacity, of course. Yeah, so you need to then ask the patient what they want. But if they're, they're not able to answer the question... Yeah, but there's also different um, levels of capacity which are required in different situations. So just because someone um, has dementia does not mean that they don't have capacity to answer certain questions. So you need to look at this very carefully. Um, it's not even just a matter of looking at someone's mini mental score and working out, oh, they fall below a certain point, so they do not have, have capacity. I think it's more complex than that. So I think in the end it is about um, asking the patient and asking them what they want but how much of that you take into account would depend on what your assessment of um, their, their capacity according to that particular question. And, and the other question to ask in that circumstance is what would your mother have wanted under this circumstance? You, you know, we, we should avoid asking the question what do you want done for your mother because that's the wrong question and we get the wrong answers so frequently with that. Um, what would your mother want done under these circumstances? And that's back to the values that, that people will often talk about, uh, you know, after Christmas dinner when they've had a couple of reds. Um, and uh, they're, they're important conversations for us. But what do you do in the situation where the family wants everything done and you think the person didn't want very much done? Well, I, I think firstly I explore what they mean by everything done because as a health professional I may well see ICU uh, in my mind's eye as I say that, and they may well see um, mum being comfortable and, uh, and well cared for uh, on a ward as, uh, as she dies. So, so it's um, easy to misunderstand what the family's talking about? Huge disconnect in uh, communication there if we don't actually tease out what they mean by uh, do everything uh, for mum. 
But also, David, you're not obliged to provide treatment if you don't think it's actually going to change the prognosis or be in the patient's interest in any way. And so as the doctor, you do have quite a bit of power to, to limit the range of options amongst which the family can choose for their, for their parent, even if they want everything done. You don't have to offer an ICU if you don't think it's going to be any help. But what I'm hearing basically is if you've done your preparatory work well, mm. and people in the community understand that they should be having these discussions with family and friends, it will make that end of life care often easier to manage, to get through. And you may have that power, Wendy, but uh, the reality is if you are contesting uh, the family's view uh, and the patient is not there to, to provide their own view, uh, you, you are in a difficult position. And uh, if you can reach consensus, so much the better because uh, there, there will be consequences long after the death. Uh, in terms of bereavement, in terms of the what-ifs that people want to ask. And uh, we need to have the opportunity for, for people to work through those at the time. Yeah, well, and I agree. It's all, I think, the art lies in the communication. But I think sometimes doctors do feel pressured to do things, even, even if the pressure's coming from inside themselves rather than somewhere else. Absolutely. And patients feel pressured to at accept. the same time to accept treatment from families. Mm. Mm. Look, thank you all very much. What are your take-home messages for those watching? Uh, respect the patient's choices where you can find out what they want, communicate and care compassionately. Yeah, I think it's um, the importance of communicating uh, well with the patient um, and setting a goal. That and works. carers, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the patient, the carers and everybody. And setting a goal that um, everybody understands and uh, hopefully agrees on. So that's uh, my take-home point. Hmm. Um, and dying is a natural part of life and uh, to have an advanced care plan in place um, a, a, in a timely manner where there's not a crisis can um, help uh, end of life care to be a lot better. So we should walk the talk and do it for ourselves? We should. Don't ask who has one here. Um, <laughs> I, I, my take home message is... I'm not going to die, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> It's good to be immortal. Um, this is a very individual journey for, for people and uh, we need to understand what's important for them in the context of their life, their families, their friends uh, and their hopes uh, at this time of their life. Look, thank you very much indeed and um, I hope you've got a lot out of this program on end-of-life care. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms and please register for CPD points by completing the attendance sheet. I'm Norman Swan. From all of us, good night.